today it is with great pleasure that I welcome Wanda First Rider to bless our event. Her Blackfoot name is Bukagai, which means little woman. She's originally from the Blood Reserve. She has lived in Calgary for over 40 years and worked for the Calgary Catholic School Board for over 35 years on Indigenous issues. She's an Indian residential school survivor and a fluent Blackfoot speaker. We have offered tobacco today to come open our event. Wanda, it is with gratitude that we welcome you to bless this event. Thank you very much. <laughs> Greetings. Um, I always start my messages with, by speaking the language. Our First Nations languages are very important to us as Indigenous people. And uh, smudge, the Amadosiman that I'm going to do, is also a very important part of our way of life. So today I bring four medicines, we call them, and I'll share them with you. I have sage, and sage grows on the prairies. Anywhere there's wild grass, you'll find sage. So we say that the sage, it uh, takes away any challenges that we might be having. It takes away any negative energies that we have um, experienced. And then the other medicine I brought was sweet grass. And sweet grass is sweet smelling. And this grows in the wetlands. And uh, with the both of these medicines, if we boil them, we can drink them as medicine. Just So we take this, it's good for colds. Uh, if we have congestion, it will take away the congestion in our chest in our nasal passages. It's good for stomach ailments. And we also use it to wash our hair with. It makes our hair nice and soft. So I also will be including some um, pine needles and cedar. So we'll be using four medicines today for the smudge. And today is a very important day. International Women's Day. And I want to say a smudge prayer for all of uh, our female sisters here. And I just want to share how important allyship is amongst us as relation, as, in, as women. And for us as Indigenous people, relationship building is so very important to us. And uh, oftentimes when we do our introduction of each other, our introductions can be quite time consuming because we want to instill and continue that relationship that we, that we want to develop with each other. So as women, sometimes we have challenges and sometimes we have obstacles that we face. And so the Amadotsima, and I brought the abalone shell to do this much, is a gift to us, to every human being, to help us when we have our challenges. And it also supports the sweet grass, brings in positive feelings, positive energies. And so we use these medicines to help us. And anytime we have an important event, anytime there's a special day that we might have. And in fact, we start our days with this much, with awa matuksimo. Our day always begins with this much. We welcome natuksi, the sun, each day. And uh, we give thanks to natuksi for all the blessings that we've had that uh, the sun shares with us here as human beings. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to light my smudge and I'm going to take some sweet grass or sage and I'm going to roll it into a ball. And uh, the sage is quite, has a strong 
aroma to it, I'll use that word. And then I'm going to take the sweet grass. And the sweet grass is very sweet smelling. I'll put that on top. And I, well, as we talk about uh, women, we know that we, we're a diverse group of women and that diversity also exists amongst our Indigenous communities. So people smudge in different ways. I think that that's important to know. And each of us have um, been taught and gifted these different ways of smudging. I'm just going to get up and get my matches here. So I'm going to let my smudge, I'm going to say a prayer in Blackfoot, my mother tongue. And I'm going to ask creator to bless each and every one of us. And although we're online, for creator to touch each and every one of our hearts. I'm now going to take the smudge. I'm going to wash my hands. I'm going to take that smudge. I'm going to cup it and take it over my body. And I'm, what I'm doing is I'm cleansing myself. I'm taking away any negative feelings, energies that I may have experienced yesterday. And then I'm going to use the last one for good luck, for hope and uh, allyship to bring all of us together here online. Ayo na pinatose. Ayo kukumitse. Ipisawakse. Pasipisawakse. Kimmong pinyan. Nukpikimmo kita nakamok si Akiiks anak. Nukspumo kinyan. Akayika kimmok si. Akay kimmok si Yose. Ayo na pinato si spumo kina nakutsapa po ako si sukapi kima bibitsin. Ayo isti beta piyo pi spumo kina nakuman stay kimo si yose. Ayo na pinato si spumo sa hamok si akik sa nak hapok da kiya. Ayo ka kimaya makupok si manya. Ayo na pinato si makita may isa pa Dosa ang ako deks mista dosa. Ayo na pinato si spumo sa ake. Nitsi tapi ake iksan ang tok na kateks kitsis daya makukot si manya. Ayo isti bay tapi o pispumo kinan. Ake ikimmo si yose. O kenong ito po pi mokkinsis. O kenong yan stay ko yote. Stiki stiku si ko anak. Makotis tapi ito si yose. Ayo na pinato si ako kina istiwa si istiwa tosi ako kina kimutio si ayo na pinato si ako kina kimutio pi ako kina utis tapi tosio si o kaya ka yeka kimutio ayo na pinato si spumo sa mukse iya ko tumik sa nakamo ah kita ako chipo spoy Ayaw na pinato si Spumos na Amanda kina Linda. Ayaw na pinato si Makumanis tayo ka kimani makumupak si Udabi sina. Ayaw na pinato si Spumo kina nakot sa papo o kakpinats o kapi ika kimani. O kene kinakunsta o kamanis tayo ko si Kulsk. So I finished my smudge. And when we finish our smudge, we take our hand to our heart to share our appreciation with Creator, our source of life. And I ask Creator to join us. And uh, we're now living in a very different time uh, because of COVID. But I think it's a special time as well. We are now being forced to use other means and ways of connecting with each other. And within our indigenous ways of knowing, our indigenous ways of teaching each other, relationship is so important. Uh, just as your theme and your topic here, allyship. 
So I ask creator to bring us all together here in Calgary. We have a diverse group of people here today that we understand each other today in spite of the diversity and possibly the different languages that we speak, that there be no barriers there, that we're there to support each other and to work hard to understand each other and that the women who are on their road to uh, their entrepreneurship, that their wish and their dreams and their hope will be accomplished. Again, thank you. My name is Dr. Amanda Williams and I'm an assistant professor in the School of Communication Studies. My pronouns are she, her. Before we begin today's session, in the spirit of respect and truth, I would like to acknowledge that Mount Royal University is located in the traditional territories of the real people of the Blackfoot Nation and the people of the Treaty 7 region in Southern Alberta, which include the Sitsika, the Pikani, the Gaina, the Sutina, and the Stony Nakoda. The city of Calgary is also home to the Métis Nation. Leading our conversation today is Dr. Linda Menigans the Associate Vice President of Indigenization and Decolonization at Mount Royal University. As MRU's Senior Indigenous Leader, she provides exceptional vision, strategy, leadership, and direction to advance indigenization and decolonization. Today, she will be interviewing two inspiring women Indigenous entrepreneurs about their journeys. Thank you, Linda. It's such a pleasure to be here and to, to uh, have an opportunity to hear the stories of entrepreneurship and, you know, growth and women and Native women and, and all the energy and the, and the beauty of uh, the work that, uh, that uh, we're going to hear all about. So, Lisa, can you tell me a, a, a bit about your yourself, your background, and your story of the barn and and how that that whole initiative came about? Well, thank you, thank you for giving me the opportunity to join you, ladies. My name is Lisa Big Snake. I'm originally from the Ochapways First Nation, Cree Nation in Saskatchewan. And I've been part of the community of the Siksika Nation for 34 years. I'm a mom of three, three sons and a proud cook of six grandchildren. For um, 15 years, uh, I'm a proud owner of Snake Stitch, an embroidery company. Uh, Snake Stitch. Um, the initiative of Snake Stitch was to provide um, apparel to the youth and community members at an affordable price. You know, uh, there was no one left out, you know, if they came to me to get apparel. So, you know, whether, uh, you know, they were on budget or, you know, I was going to assure that everybody would represent whatever team or association that they wanted to. Olivia, if you could share with us uh, a bit about your journey and, and if you could talk a little bit about your background and who you are and what you're doing. Dennett Adas is a Olivia Manoons Ata. My name is Livia Minimuns. My tr traditional name is Blackfoot Woman. I am from the Sutena, the Siksika, and the Stony Nakoda Nations. My father was Sutena, my mother was Blackfoot. Um, I'm the owner and founder of Dance and Storm Designs. I created, it was formerly known as Dance and Storm Creations, uh, created back in 2017. I, I do Indigenous fashion, uh, specifically formal wear, uh, rooted deep in Indigenous culture. Uh, my journey began back when, uh, back in 2017. Um, it, it comes from, it stems from a little bit of a hardship story. Uh, my, I was a caregiver to my parents. Unfortunately, my father had passed away the same day that my dad passed away. My mother was diagnosed with a rare blood cancer. 
And I had to take out time from work to sit beside her and to help be her caregiver during that time. Uh, unfortunately, she passed away just a little bit, a year over uh, after my father had passed. So during that time, being a caregiver uh, for her during her, her journey, um, I began sewing, uh, beading um, little pieces uh, for myself. And then eventually I started posting on social media. Social media has so much influence and power that it, can take you anywhere basically and I start soon enough I start to get orders start caring for everybody and it was during like the, around the Christmas rush I was just jam-packed with orders and uh, trying to get them done and so that's what, what really got me through it was very therapeutic during such a tough time in my life originally I wanted to be a fashion designer when I was growing up um, I come from a cowboy lifestyle my dad was a champion cowboy my mom was a homemaker Unfortunately, they they went to Indian residential school. My mom went to a residential school in Siksika. My dad went to day school in Sutina. So with that, it wasn't always um, the best environment growing up. Um, you know, just because of what was taken away from them. Uh, they weren't allowed to speak their language. They weren't allowed to practice our ways, our culture. So I grew up with the the very basics. I grew up with enough knowledge, um, but for me, it was very, very basic, but yet still traditional and strong in spirituality. It was just more of the, the protocols and the practices of creating in our traditional galia. I didn't have uh, my grannies or my grandpas around me just because um, my parents had me when they're up there in age. So I had elders as parents. So I am the youngest of six children. Uh, so I didn't, I wasn't able to have those teachings from my grandparents. I had to navigate that on my own growing up. So in high school, um, I wanted to be an Indian. I wanted to go in traditional regalia. So when I did, I started creating things for myself. And eventually I got a hit with the passion for creating clothing. But I didn't have the support or the funding or the resources to move forward in that area of being a fashion designer, just because back then it wasn't doable. There wasn't much opportunity for Indigenous people to be fashion designers. There was a few people I looked up to, but um, it wasn't out there as much as it is today. There's not, there's many more opportunities, much more support. Uh, back when I wanted to do it, it, it just wasn't doable. So I ended up uh, getting into broadcasting. Um, I got into broadcast and I wanted to be a journalist just because I got that exposure from when I became a Calgary Stampede First Nation princess. And it was through that experience I was able to fulfill one of my dreams of becoming a journalist. I ended up working with CBC Calgary News as a reporter. I operated a pop-up bureau, first of its kind in Canada, as well as I worked on two radio, uh, radio shows as associate producer. And now I'm currently working on a CBC documentary about water rights for First Nations people. And so with that, my, going back to my whole fashion design, I got into that um, when I had to take time off of work to be a caregiver for my mom. And it just kind of went out on its way. And uh, here I am. I'm operating my, my own business. It's a, I'm a first generation business owner. And, you know, and I really attribute my, uh, my business to my parents, uh, to my community and to my traditional way of life as well. Um, I wouldn't be here without, the, without that knowledge, those practices or those protocols. Yes. So, so what I'm hearing quite strongly is your culture is very much uh, a part of, of this work. I know, Lisa, uh, you were talking about um, your the barn and also besides the barn, you've also got the white buffalo. Can you tell us about that? Yes, the, the white buffalo. We've um, been caregivers of the white buffalo for, for a year and a half now. Mm. Um, in, our, in our community, a lot of uh, the programs and services, um, they will put the buffalo because of the strength and the, majest the majestic of the animal. And the buffalo holds a lot of meaning and uh, <clears throat> significance in our culture. Yes, the, the buffalo is held with 
with high honor in our communities, you know, to show the strength and hope, you know, uh, mm -hmm. in the years before they used the buffalo for many things with uh, the reconciliation of our people, you know, the truth and reconciliation that has been spoken of. The buffalo arrived in Siksika, like you say, a year and a half ago, and many visitors have come to uh, honor them, but also non-Indigenous people to yeah. come in and, and get answers, you know, it, it wasn't taught in the education system, you know, but to speak and see what we honor is beautiful. We've had the opportunity to uh, have charter buses of elders come mm. and pray with the buffalo. You know, so some people come for prayer and some people come to receive prayer and guidance. So it, it's, it's quite the journey having the buffalo around the barn. You know, um, the barn is situated closely to the buffalo. So on a daily, you know, I, I believe that everything that leaves the barn is blessed by the buffalo, the white buffalo. It's not the ordinary brown buffalo that we're accustomed to seeing. It's the white buffalo that is here. So the blessings are given every time people purchase or come and visit. So it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. That sounds fabulous. And I, I have been there and I, I had the opportunity of being able to see that baby buffalo. And it was just so awesome. I mean, it's just like our 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 world is the reality of our world is is seems to be be coming and uh, stronger in our our in our visual uh, part of our world. Um, I know we live it in our hearts and and uh, we're we're welcomed these days to be able to express to put our designs out there to put all our 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 visual parts of our culture into the world today and and whatnot so so olivia um can you share with us some of the some of the uh goals that you have in the in the future and um where you think you're going to be going with your designs if you if you had every all the support in the world that you wanted what would you be doing uh, well, I thought I thought long and hard of you know my goals. Um, to be honest, I never thought I would be a business owner. Um, I never thought I'd be doing fashion shows or even creating fashion. Uh, a lot of my work was a form of uh, therapy for me to get over my my loss and my grief. Uh, but also it opened up new doors of opportunity. It helped me connect more to my my culture, to my background. And it really helped me to finesse what I really wanted to do in life, um, besides being a journalist and all the other hats that we wear as Indigenous women. Um, you know, most importantly, I want to be Indigenous, uh, known, uh, known as an Indigenous designer in mainstream fashion. You know, I want to be part of fashion shows that are in Paris, New York, um, Vancouver, Toronto, um, which I'll be part of uh, Indigenous Fashion Week Toronto in June 2022. So I'm very select, uh, very excited to be a featured runway designer with my collection called Clou, which means medicine in Sutena. And I really hope that one day that I'll be able to uh, create opportunity for others that want to follow within this uh, same area of interest, you know, for the next generation. Because I know it was really hard for me to get to where I am. And, you know, there's still, there's still a lot of things that I'm navigating. Um, but I really hope one day that I'll have, be able to have, open up a shop uh, or shops or, like I said, be a part of something bigger. Um, right now, I'm just going to take it one day at a time and see where I end up. And I hope that I really inspire others. You know, I can take something so tragic as loss and create it into something beautiful through my pieces. And a lot of my pieces um, not only honor my tradition, my culture, but they honor my family, especially my parents. And even right down to my animals, Dance and Storm is the name of a horse that I raised. And so I named my company after my horse because I'm a horsewoman as well. 
I love horses and animals and culture and you know with fashion this is where I ended up and I'm just gonna keep taking it one day at a time and see where how it turns out. <laughs> well, that's just fabulous oh my goodness I I, I I hope I can spend some time with you and take a look at all these beautiful designs that you have. I would just love to do that because I like to wear and show who I am too, in, in, especially in uh, public places and stuff like that. So uh, Lisa, I know that one of the, one of the values that you really uh, speak about is making sure that uh, everybody can can be treated equally or ne never be left behind. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Well, with our with our within our people, you know, um, no disrespect to any, but um, there's a lot of poverty with our people, and I, you know, growing up in that poverty and not being able to afford you know, whatever, you know, mainstream children had. This is my opportunity to show that they, they matter, you know, mm -hmm. that they can have that opportunity to, you know, the biggest thing in life is putting pride into people. So when I stitch, I, I have a good, strong spirit. When I go into the barn to, to do the work, you know, um, every every child matters you know they they have that orange shirt going on where every child matters and i live that that life before it it came to surface to say that to put the pride into the youth you know to be part of a team you know some some people feel left out and i don't allow that to happen with business you know it, it's not somewhat about the money it's about putting putting a smile on somebody and giving somebody some confidence and that's what i do with with the embroidery you know the embroidery tells a story and the children understand that story when when they wear the product that we do in the boards yeah that's just absolutely amazing and i and I'm hearing uh, from both of you that this isn't about money. This isn't about, you know, ego and status and, you know, like uh, achieving um, goals that are just about labeling and, you know, uh, talking about how many million you made or anything. I haven't heard either one of you mention money. So tell me, Lisa, um, with that kind of a pride, you know, that, 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 that value that you instill into your products, do you believe that that creates and builds community? Yes, because a lot of the, the product that I do, you know, with the trauma that a lot of our people faced, you know, with our parents, I was raised by a single mother. Mm -hmm. I have three brothers. You know, and she did a very good job in, in raising us and instilling us, instilling to work hard, you know, to do things right. You know, she'd always say, do things right the first time so you don't have to do it again. You know, that was something that I heard over and over, whether it was, you know, something she was taught in residential school to, to make sure that you know, her pride in her work was being shown when, when I do, when I do something, I make sure that it's done right. If it's not, you know, like, you know, you say it's not about money. It's not, it, it's about putting pride in our community. You know, our community is broken. You know, some people in the community don't understand that it, it's up to them to put the pride in. So I help them by dressing them with pride. You know, whether it's the logo of the Six Carnation or, you know, a hockey logo, you're putting that pride back in one person at a time. 
And I think I'm accomplishing that. That's absolutely beautiful. Um, Livia, can you um, explain perhaps some of the values and 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 whatnot, the traditional uh, teachings that you've had over through your life uh, and, and how those influence the way you approach the, the designs that you have. I know you're talking about your horse and, and whatnot. So uh, how do you pull that together? To be honest, I, I take what works for me. Um, you know, I take every aspect of my life and put it all together. As long as that there's that balance there, um, I'm able to move forward. Um, like I mentioned before, um, you know, this has been very therapeutic for me. Um, through designing from to creating, I combine my passion with my roots and I'm healing through the threads of my creation. Like my slogan for my business is a buffalo robe tells the stories of my ancestors, my creations tell my story. So a lot of the value is very heavily emphasized on knowledge, um, being a knowledge keeper, um, you know, trying to carry on that legacy of my grandparents, the legacy of my parents. And it's not only just, you know, for to do it for business wise, it's to do it for myself so I can pass that on to the future generation, to the younger people in my family, to, to my grandchildren. Um, I love each and every one of them. Uh, all my nieces and nephews were raised were, were at all the same, around the same age group and they all have little ones. And, you know, they all call me grandma. So for me, I am a grandma there too. It, that's just the way our kinship works within, you know, indigenous uh, families, right? Our nieces and nephews, uh, their children can call us grandma and grandpa, like aunts and uncles and stuff like that could be, you know, our cousins could be our brothers and sisters and what, so on. So for me, I, I really do it for them. I really hope that one day that they operate their own businesses, that they're successful, but they move forward with that knowledge of who we are, where we come from, our family, those traditions and those protocols. And also too is I'm an advocate of indigenous art, support indigenous art by indigenous artists. And I always make sure that there's no cultural appropriation as well that goes on, right? So I try to make my my fashion wearable for Indigenous and non-Indigenous people. And I create one of a kind custom pieces when it comes to formal wear. So a lot of the designs come from family. And I always make sure that I tell the customers like, okay, this is a family family design, you can't replicate this. Or if they have a design, I'm like, okay, it's not gonna be replicated. I'm not gonna take that. So everything is designed from start to, uh, from start to ending with, um, I guess, knowledge in mind from symbol, uh, from the meaning of symbols, um, meaning behind each design and even textiles, working with different kinds of textiles like buffalo hide, uh, buckskin, moose, even with, you know, little pieces like deer hooves, elk teeth, bear claws, uh, having that knowledge behind and how to harvest those kind of things or known, known of people how to do that and creating networks as well. So there's a lot of work that goes into it. You know, it's not only just sitting there and sewing and creating, there's also forms of how to get the supplies, you know, and creating networks of people that know how to do it or if they can't find it, sometimes you have to learn yourself and a lot of the stuff I had to learn on my own and navigate away. So what's important here is the values of culture and how to proceed forward with respect. And that's what I carry with me every day when I create something. Yes, and, and that's what I'm hearing from bo both of you is that the parameters of, or the, the context of your work is, is guided by the values from community and, or the teachings from your, your family members or, you know, and knowing and respecting those are kind of the core that kind of um, guide you. And I, I just, I love to hear about that. But also what I'm hearing is this incredible source of creativity that you both have. You seem to be drawing from a, just a, a natural ability to be able to create and, and draw your designs. I know, uh, Lisa, when I was at the barn, I mean, just the beautiful works that are there. Um, 
and your ability to just sew it on that sewing machine is astounding to me. How long did it take you to learn how to operate the sewing machines? Well, the first thing that I had to learn is how to turn the power on. Because <laughs> when I purchased the machine, I had to learn how to turn the power on. So when they delivered it, the mach my first machine to me, I said, show me where the power button is and I will, I will teach myself. So I too, to learn the machine, it took me six months. You know, I kept it very quiet within our community to them to know that, that I had an embroidery machine that, um, because I didn't want to fail. I didn't want to put things out that, that weren't the best that I could do. So about six months into having my first embroidery machine, I was able to let the community know that I was ready to do it. My work, when I was thinking about it, my work reflects somewhat like bead work. You know, beaders will, will bead colors. You know, there's coordination of color. You know, the fire color showing strength you know, the sunset colors. So when I was thinking of embroidering, I wanted to incorporate the colors of beadwork, like to make the embroidery stand out, like the beauty of beadwork. And I think I've accomplished that. I would say you definitely have done that. <laughs> it's just absolutely awesome. So, uh, Livia, how do you incorporate or think about your designs? Where does that come from? Uh, as I mentioned before, my designs do come from family designs. Uh, a lot of my uh, grandmother, my late grandmother, Annie Simeon, uh, a lot of her designs, she's she was a beater, she was a sewer. She created a lot of different works for different families in the community. And, you know, naturally I, I pick that up. Um, uh, a lot of my designs are family designs, a lot of drawn information, uh, drawn inspiration from those, those designs and kind of created my own. So it's like a concept of living that Western lifestyle, what works with, you know, horses and what works with indigenous culture and our horses, uh, a lot of uh, our culture inspires my, my works. Um, a lot of the geometric designs from the landscape of where I live in Treaty 7 area. So that's where I draw inspiration from, is from the land, from my family designs. Um, and sometimes too, it just it just comes to me, like if I'm feeling like I need to create something, I'm like, uh, just trust the process and create it and see how it turns out, basically. I'm not the one to really plan ahead for stuff. I just go, take it as it comes, right? That inspiration will come and it'll hit when it needs to. But also, too, is that I try to incorporate spirituality into it, um, you know, from Crater's perspective that, you know, we're all his children and he created this beautiful area, this earth and all the animals and everything has a story behind it from the herbs, from the medicines, from the animals. And a lot of, too, is a lot of the stories that come from my people. Uh, so I like to draw inspiration from everywhere as much as I can, as much as I can, that's possible to. And that's where a lot of my work stems from. I started creating my own uh, fabric, my own designs on fabric for my formal wear gowns. And that, like I mentioned before, I textiles from natural resources, like from buffalo and deer skin and moose and deer, deer, yeah, and so on. Yeah, so that's a little bit about my inspiration. That's great, you know, and I, I'm just, now I wanna go and get a get a project going because <laughs> I like baking things too I think we all have as indigenous people we have a really strong creative side of our 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 minds the way we think about things and we're quite visual as well we're visual learners and and whatnot so so um Lisa what would you like to share um if you were to um inspire somebody to go ahead and you know be brave and follow their follow their path what messages would you give somebody in order to encourage them 
the message that I would give was to believe in yourself. You know, mm. um, when it's different with First Nations, living in First Nation communities, you know, um, we were always told through residential school uh, as it is spoken that uh, we were told what to do, but to take that initiative on your own is is something different and the benefits of that shows success you know you, you uh if a young person and i i do get quite a few people coming to say you know how did you do it like what did you do you know and i would say believe in yourself that's the main thing is to believe in yourself there's going to be so many paths that are going to be on that road to success but you know choosing a path isn't a wrong right or a wrong path you know it's gonna it's gonna teach you something you know whether it it is something that trips you up or you know it doesn't work then okay there's another path to follow like don't give up you know through the years of um, running snake stitch you know like you mentioned, we all have that creativity, you know, we live amongst, you know, we go to the celebrations of our people and see the beautiful regalia with colors and stuff. That, that can, you know, that is what I did with embroidery, you know, with the stitch, with threads, you know, I, I created designs. I had, I, I had a, um, a business, come to me and, and ask, you know, they're looking for Aboriginal people to do, to do work. And they say, we don't do just the regular embroidery. We do art onto clothing. And, you know, everybody, you know, there's some artists that are, um, that do painting on hide, like Livia, she, she sews dresses, you know, the ribbon skirts. You know, it's all, whatever they do, like, keep focused and follow your dreams, you know, and, and collect people that can lift you up when, when you fall, because that's what you need. You know, you don't give up. Yeah. Thank you. That's really uh, wonderful messages. And, and Livia, what would you, um, how would you encourage people to, to, uh, follow their dreams um you know for me talking from experiences just finding your way finding what works and if something doesn't work take that out and a lot of it too is that um who you surround yourself with you know you have to build a support system it may not always be family but sometimes there'll be people that you met along the way and they connect you to someone I wouldn't be where I am today or in, you know, with all these amazing opportunities like that are far fetched for me. I wouldn't even think I'd be doing them just because I didn't think it was possible. I wouldn't be here without community. I wouldn't be here without people, not only from my community, but outside as well. You know, I had so many um, non Indigenous people I met through along my journeys where I consider them family and they've really pushed me forward to be the better version of myself all the time. You know, even when I was going through tough times, um, especially with the grief and loss of my family members, uh, especially my parents, my siblings, and, you know, I I built a tribe for myself. I call it the, the live tribe. So I'm a collector of people and it wouldn't be because of those people. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't without their uplifted messages, their encouragement, their support, and most of all, their love. Um, and that's one of the things that we always have to do as well as learning to love ourselves and showing up as the best version as we can and making, creating networks and just finding out what, what you're passionate about. Uh, it took me a while to get to where I am to be passionate, to find that passion again when I was shut down the first time. So I found my passion again and I'm making it work the second time around and seeing where it goes. Jay, that Thank you. Both of you have got such uh, rich, rich um, stories to tell and wonderful experiences. And, and it's so encouraging to know 
that you can be successful and you don't have to move away from the culture to do that. That instead, it actually becomes the core of, of I wouldn't say success, but growth, I guess, natural growth um, and the values that uh, are influencing you know, the way that you work and the way that you talk about um, encouraging other people is also instilled with those cultural values. So I am so happy to have had this opportunity to hear from both of you. And I look forward to getting and meeting you face to face <laughs> pretty soon and actually um, exploring some more uh, about what your work is all about and whatnot. So I thank you for coming on and being part of this um, this wonderful uh, International Women's Days events. And uh, we will see you in person. Thank you. <laughs>